Hey, it's Tony D. And in this video, we're going to look at MicroPython and how to control digital I.O. or inputs and outputs. And so in the past, I've done a bunch of videos on the basics of like, what is MicroPython? How you get started using it? Like what's a MicroPython board? How to load it on there? And look in the description when this goes up on YouTube down below, and I'll have a link to the What is MicroPython guide. If you're totally new to MicroPython, go check that out first. It has all kinds of links to other guides uh, to just get some background info. But for this video and for a bunch of future videos, I want to start digging into how to talk to hardware with MicroPython. So how to control things like the pins that are on a board, like the inputs and the outputs, uh, how to talk to different devices like an I2C or a spy device, different things like that. So for this video, we'll just start with the very basics of digital input and output. Uh, it really can't get much simpler than that. And I say digital I.O. because when it's a digital input or output, it's an on or an off signal. Basically, it's a high or low value, and it's nothing in between. You know, you can't have half on, half off. It's on or off. And it really comes down to the value of the voltage uh, that's on a pin. So if it's a high logic level, then depends what voltage the board runs at, but it's probably like 3.3 or 5 volts. Uh, for an Arduino, for example, uh, it runs at 5 volts. So when you use a digital output and you set it to a high level, it's going to go to 5 volts. Whereas for a board like the ESP8266, it runs at 3.3 volts, uh, so a little bit different. But the basic idea is that you know you have a high level when you have voltage, and then a low level is usually zero volts or ground or no voltage uh, there. And so that's what gives you that on and off signal. And this is I.O., so inputs and outputs. So you can have an output, which is basically a pin that you can control the output voltage to either a high or a low logic level, which seems a little simple, but even just with that on off, you can start to do a lot of cool stuff with that. Like you can light up an LED, for example, which I'll show in this video, how to turn an LED on and off. Simple, basic, but you can still do a lot with that. You know, like if you're building some kind of cool cosplay thing and you want a bunch of lights on it, maybe animating them in different ways, it's just turning LEDs on and off. You know, it really isn't that complex. Uh, so, you know, even though it's simple, it's not that, uh, not that it's not powerful. And there's a lot more you can do too, though. So you could connect like a transistor, which is kind of like, think of it like an electronically operated switch in some ways. It's simplifying it a lot. Uh, but you can turn on and off another signal with that. So you can control like maybe a high power uh, motor or a solenoid or something like that uh, with a, a transistor. And you can also control a relay, which is kind of like another type of switch. It's a magnetic, more of a mechanical switch. And so you can control things like maybe, uh, you know, line level voltage, like mains voltage for turning on a light or, you know, a, a, a uh, like electronic device or something. Uh, maybe build like a sous vide cooker where you're turning on and off uh, the a heating element to control temperature of water. So again, it's just an on and off signal in those cases, a digital output. Uh, and then a digital input is when you can read one of these digital signals from an input pin. So you might have something connected to a pin on a board, and then you can tell, is it at a high level? Is it at like a 3.3 or 5 volt voltage level? Or is it at a low level, like zero volts or ground? Uh, and so this is good for like reading a button or a switch where you know you press a contact and that might connect the signal to ground or to a high logic level. And you can read that from a digital input. Uh, but other things too, there are some digital sensors, I wouldn't say digital sensors, but a simple digital-like device where like a PIR, a pyroelectric uh, infrared motion sensor, these are little sensors that uh, detect is someone in a room. So they can tell if there's been movement. They look at like the movement of heat uh, in a room. And uh, those sensors basically give you a single output. Uh, and that output goes to a high level when it detects movement and then falls back down to a lower ground level when there's no movement. So you could read that with the digital input, for example, here. So lots of cool things that you can do just with the basics of digital input and output. And I wanna show in this video how you can control digital IO with MicroPython. It's actually really simple. In just a few lines of code, you will be a digital IO master. So let's just kind of dive in here and see what we've got. Uh, the main view here with everything. So in the uh, upper right corner here, this is the ESP8266 Feather Huzzah uh, board, which is one I've been using for all the videos in this series. Real nice board that runs MicroPython, uh, definitely worth checking it out. But you could use any MicroPython board for this like I have right here. This is uh, the Pi board. So another uh, fancy, nice little board to think about. Uh, so that's the board that I have right here. 
And then connected to it, I'll get more into this, but I just have an LED, a red LED right here. And this is a little push button right here that I've connected. So we'll see how to use both these devices in this video. Uh, and then on the desktop here, I have a link to surprise prize, a guide that uh, was just published in the learning system. Uh, we'll blog this up later, but it's uh, a guide exactly on this topic on just how to access digital IO with MicroPython. And so I'll just run through this real quick. And this hopefully won't be too long of a video uh, because there's really not too much to digital IO. It's, it's not that complex, but again, still pretty powerful, like just on off signals. You can do a lot with that. Uh, so let's dive in. And uh, just to start, like I mentioned, you know, I have links to, if you're totally new to MicroPython, read some of these getting started guides here uh, to just get the basics. You know, you're going to need a board that's running MicroPython. And if you're using this ESP8266, you have to load the firmware onto it. So a little bit of setup, uh, but it's, it's not difficult to do that. So let's dive in and let's play with some of the digital outputs here. Uh, so for this example, I basically show, and I even link to, there's a whole separate guide right here that it links to on just how to blink an LED with MicroPython, which I already did a guide on, which is basically the same as using a digital output. Uh, so, you know, check out this guide. This, this goes into a little bit more details uh, for it, but I just wanted to be a little more complete here, you know, and, and if we're talking about digital IO, then of course we've talked about digital outputs. Uh, so I wired up this circuit exactly right here where I'm using uh, pin number 15 on the ESP8266. That's connected to uh, the longer leg of the LED. That's where you want to send the voltage into it. And then that goes uh, through this resistor right here down to the ground on the board. And it's very important. You do need a resistor. This is a 560 ohm resistor. Anything from like 300 ohms or higher up to like 3000 or so should work because uh, you want to limit the current. If you didn't have this resistor here, when you turn on this LED, you're just going to send all of this current straight through ground. There's nothing limiting in it and you could damage the board. So you need a, a resistor here to say, okay, let's, you know, we're not, we don't want to blow up the LED. You're not going to blow it up, but you could kill it. Uh, so that, that's what the resistor is there for. Uh, so that's what this explains how to do. So uh, that's what I've got wired up here. Now mine looks a little bit different because I also have a switch right here that we'll come back to, but my wiring is exactly the same. This orange wire right here is connected to pin 15 on the ESP8266. And then there's the resistor right there and it's connected to this green wire that goes down to ground right there. So then the next thing is, let's just connect to the REPL. Uh, and if you don't know what the REPL is, again, go back to those MicroPython basics videos. I explain, you know, how to connect to this REPL, the read evaluate print loop, where you can start running Python uh, instructions on the board. So let's do that. We'll use uh, the screen command on Windows. You'll use PuTTY or, you know, some kind of serial terminal. Uh, and I'll connect to the board. And uh, so here's basically the uh, REPL for Python. And let's just see what we want to do. So the first command that we'll do, uh, we'll run a couple commands here. You have to import the machine module. And the machine module is pretty much the standard interface for all of the hardware access in MicroPython. And it's slightly changed. If you use the Pi board, for example, that I was showing earlier, earlier versions of the Pi board um, use this PYB, the Pi, Pi B class which is similar to the machine class. I think eventually they're gonna add the full machine class to the Pi board. So just be aware, if you're using the Pi board, check the documentation for the Pi board because it might be a little bit different than what we show. For all of this digital IO stuff, I actually tried it out and it's exactly the same right now. So you can use this, but in the future, there might be some differences between these boards. Uh, but anyways, okay, so we import the machine module. And actually, if you don't know what the import command is, I just did a video uh, last week on uh, on how to, or no, actually it was, uh, I think it was Monday. Boy, I can't even remember anymore. But the last video I did was on how to import modules and what it means. So basically, you know, someone wrote some code that defines this machine module. It's embedded in the MicroPython firmware. And this import statement allows me to use uh, the different functions and code inside of that module. Now the next line here is creating a pin object. And so I'll just type in exactly here uh, what it is. So, you know, I'm just making a pin variable and we'll assign this a value of an instance. We're gonna create an instance of the machine.pin class. And so, you know, you're just creating a class. The class has an initializer function, which you need to pass some parameters to. And there are two parameters you need to pass to this. The first parameter is the pin number or name. So in this case, it's pin number 15 that I have connected to the LED. Uh, and then the next parameter is the type of 
digital I.O. pin. So whether it's an input or an output. And in this case, we're making this an output. So we want to use machine.pin.out, which is basically just a constant value. That's how MicroPython knows that the type of pin you want to create is an output. You just give it this fixed value here. So, okay, so that's pretty easy. We've created this value. And by the way, quick little note too, like you might wonder, okay, which pin numbers can I use? Uh, go to your board's documentation. I, I mentioned right here, I, I give a link to the what is MicroPython guide. Uh, we're down at the bottom. I have this kind of where can I learn more, which uh, I have a link to all of the documentation specific to each board. So just in general, always go there to check out, you know, what's specific to your board because there are some small differences between the boards. And so like one of the differences, for example, with the ESP8266, and I'll put links to all of these uh, things that I'm showing in the description below and this goes up on YouTube. So if you're wondering, you know, where these web pages are, uh, check below. But uh, this is the ESP8266. And so you can see this talks, this is the GPIO section of the documentation. And it mentions, um, you know, there's a limited number of pins that you can use because this is a small little module. It doesn't have a ton of uh, GPIO pins. So there are a bunch of pins here. And I'll mention a little later, uh, not all of these pins you can use in the way that you might expect. Like pin number 15, for example, I'm using it as an output, which is okay, but I can't really use this pin as an input. And I'll tell you why later, because there's other stuff connected to it. So just kind of be aware that there's sometimes quirks just with the module itself. Uh, so you might need to read a little bit about the ESP8266 itself if you start running into some different problems and things. Uh, but you can see, okay, so there's a few pins that the ESP8266 can use. Now for the Pi board, so this is the documentation for that Pi board that I was showing earlier. You know, it's a little bit more complex of a chip, so it has a lot more pins. You know, there's, uh, I don't know, at least like 20 or 30 outputs, it looks like right there. Uh, and these things have different functions and all kinds of cool stuff it can do. But it actually refers to its pins by a string, like a name. So there's a pin like C6 or C7 or B8 or B9. Uh, and they actually show you here, like the pins in GPIO, if you create a pin object here, you're not passing a number, you're actually passing a string value like X2 right here. So just be aware that things might be a little bit different for your board. Uh, so check out the documentation for that. But for the ESP8266, I'm just using pin numbers here. And it's just a normal like integer number that you wanna use here. You don't wanna use a string. Um, okay, so we've got our pin object. And so let's go back to the tutorial. And so now that you have this pin object, you can call functions on it. And the one function that you probably want to use is pin.value. And so when you call pin.value, you pass it a parameter. And this value, this parameter, if it's a true value, then it sets the pin to a high level. And if it's a false value, it sets it to a low level. And so in Python, like zero is false and one is true. So if I say pin.value one, check that out, LED turns on. And then pin.value two or zero, then LED turns off. And I guess just for fun, let's see what happens. Pin.value two turns on because two is not zero, so it's true. Uh, but you can also use true and false, you know, like Python uh, kind of uh, Boolean values here. So this works and is all fun. Uh, so let's see, let's turn on with true. So there we go, so that's all cool. Uh, so super easy, super simple, but again, the basics. I mean, if I had like a relay connected to this, this could be turning on and off some like high powered device or, you know, transistor connected to this, or, you know, maybe like uh, the audio effects board, for example, if you just wanted to like play some sound effects and you didn't want to get like real complex and try to, you know, have like talking to an I2S DAC or something, you know, like use the audio effects board. Uh, it's a lot easier. And, but with that board, you need to send it like a digital signal and on or off to say, okay, play this sound effect or play that sound effect. You can do that with MicroPython and just a simple little pin dot value function here. Now, the only other thing left with digital outputs, they have a little convenience function. You can call pin dot high and pin dot low. So it just makes it a little bit simpler. If I call pin dot low, it turns it off and pin dot high it turns it back on uh, like that. So you know, simple, but uh, use whatever works for you. Like the, the value function is nice in that like maybe you're computing something, you know, you called some web service and then you got back a result that says, you know, maybe this Twitch streamer is on air now. And so I want to like make a siren play or something like that. Uh, and so you get some value and then you can just pass that as a true or false value to the pin dot value function. Or maybe you know for sure, like you're blinking an LED and you, you know, absolutely want the LED to be on, then you can just call pin dot high 
apply. So use whichever function. It honestly doesn't matter that much uh, performance wise. Uh, you know, don't worry so much about like, oh my gosh, like uh, you've got to send a parameter and that's maybe going to allocate some memory or whatever. Don't worry about it. It's fine uh, in this case. So that's digital outputs. You know, it's that simple. Like really you just create an instance of this machine.pin class. And the, the real important thing is this second parameter here that says this is an output type pin. And then once you do that, you can use the value function or the low and high functions to control it. Um, so, okay, so that's cool. So let's check out digital inputs, the next thing here. So um, now in this little section here, I show a little more detail because I show how to wire up a momentary push button to uh, the board. And so that's, I, I have a little link right here to like these buttons right here. Uh, it's just a really simple button. These types of buttons, you can usually put them on a breadboard like this. They'll have four little legs and they're kind of connected in a way so that, um, you know, it, when you press the button, it connects one half to the other half. And so the easiest way to wire these up, because sometimes you have to like guess and wonder, okay, you know, if I wire, if I put both the wires on this half, are they actually on the half that's connected? And then it's, you know, your button's always on. Uh, connect to opposite corners, and then you never have to wonder if you've connected it the right way. Uh, because for sure, if you connect to the opposite corners, then no matter which way this button is oriented, uh, unless it's some really insane button that I've never seen, uh, you're gonna uh, at least get on both halves of the button. So, but the way this button works, you know, you press this button and it's connecting the two halves here. And then the way that we wire this up to the board, and so I'll go into a little more detail on this. Um, we connect one half of the button to ground and then the other half of the button to an input on the board, uh, a GPIO pin. So th in this case, I'm using pin 12. And you might wonder, well, why not use pin 15 on the board like we were using for the LED? Uh, and there's actually a good reason. It's because on the ESP8266, GPIO 15 has a special purpose. When the board boots up, it has to be held down to ground, I think at a low level. And so there's actually a little pull down resistor, or maybe it's a pull up resistor. I, I can't remember which one, but there is a resistor connected to that GPIO pin. And it's a, it's a small one, it doesn't pull a lot of current, but it interferes. If I set this as an input, then that pin is always gonna be seen at whatever level that resistor is pulling it up or down to. So it's gonna confuse you. You're not gonna be able to read the button. It's gonna be a little weird. Uh, and it's, you know, it's unfortunately a thing that's, uh, there's, there's no good place to find this until you just kind of uh, run into the problem and then start Googling it and figure it out yourself. But, so just be aware, pin 15, not a good one to use as an input. You can use it as, as an output though. It's fine to use that as an output. Uh, so in this case, I use pin 12 where there's nothing connected to it and uh, everything should work for this. So, uh, okay, so anyways, so the way this thing is connected though, uh, and how we can read this, because you might be wondering, okay, I can see it's connected to ground. So when I press this button, it's gonna connect this input pin to ground. So for sure I can read that as a low logic level, like ground is the low logic level. Uh, but what happens when the button's not pressed? So if you do nothing, when the button's not pressed, this input pin is connected to the button. The button's not connected to anything else. So this thing is basically floating, which just means that it's there's nothing pulling it to a high or low level. It can fluctuate between random values just based on like, you know, is your finger near it and the, you know, the electromagnetic field and the capacitance that it, you know, can influence it might change it some random way. The breadboard itself might be, you know, picking up straight capacitance and uh, the bottom line is you're gonna see weird random behavior, uh, but there's a way around that. It's a really common thing, and they've actually built things into little microcontrollers like this, where it, you can enable a pull-up resistor, an internal pull-up resistor on this input pin. You won't see it anywhere, it's internal to the chip, but when you flip that on, then basically if nothing is connected to that input, it's gonna be pulled up to a high logic level of, because of this small little uh, resistor there. And so then that's perfect because when the button isn't pressed, there's nothing else connected to this input. The pull-up resistor will pull it up to a high logic level. And then when we read that input, we'll see, okay, we're at a high logic level. Uh, and at a high logic level, then I must know that the button's not pressed. And then when you press the button, it's gonna connect it to ground. 
And you know, that's fine because you have a small resistor that's pulling you up to a high logic level and you're just gonna pull a small amount of current down to ground. And then this input is basically gonna uh, fall down to the, the level of ground that it's connected to. So it will go down to a low logic level at that point. So the input or the uh, internal pull-up resistor, it's not gonna affect like, you know, it's, it's never gonna always be stuck at a high logic level. When you connect it to ground, that input is connected to ground. It's going to be at zero volts at the ground logic level. And so that's what you're gonna read on the input uh, there. So that's how it works. We're gonna use this internal pull-up resistor. Now I do mention, um, you know, not every board supports pull-up resistors, and even on a board, not every pin supports pull-up resistors. Like I noticed on the ESP8266, I think pin number 16 I tried to use with an internal pull-up. And the nice thing is MicroPython actually threw an exception and said, hey, uh, you can't use a pull-up resistor on this pin, sorry. Well, which is really nice. Props to the MicroPython guys for making that uh, easy to, uh, to figure out. So just be aware, you know, not everything supports it. If you don't have an internal pull-up resistor, um, I just mentioned you can add an external one. So just like I have a resistor connected to this LED, uh, just connect a resistor from your input pin up to the high logic level, which is usually like 3.3 volts, or if you know for sure your board is a five volt board, then you could use that. But in most cases, stick with 3.3 volts. Uh, so, you know, a resistor, and it could be the, almost any size resistor, the higher the better. So like 10 to 100 uh, kilo ohms is probably fine, just because it's always pulling a little bit of current. So you don't want, you know, some low value that's pulling, uh, hopefully not amps of current, uh, you know, but even uh, milliamps, you, you don't need that. You just need a few, you know, tens of a mil, uh, tenth of a milliamp at most maybe. So you do need that pull-up resistor though, because that's the magic thing with this button orientation that lets us detect, is it pressed or not pressed? Just based on, is it connected to ground or is it pulled back up to a high logic level here? Uh, so that's what uh, all of the, the start of this tutorial talks about is just you know how to do this wiring for that. And that's what I've got wired up right here with this button. So the next thing is, let's make a digital input now. So uh, the first thing is import the machine module. Now you don't have to do this over and over. I don't have to run import machine again right now. Um, you know, I just show it because if you're starting from scratch, you do have to run it at least once. But if you know it's already been run within this session, uh, and, and the session in the sense of not the screen session, because I can actually quit this terminal and then reconnect, and all of those objects still exist. So I can say like pin.high, it's still there, and pin.low. Now if I reset the board, uh, which actually, I might as well do that. You know, I, I just reset the board and now this pin object doesn't exist anymore. So, you know, as long as the board hasn't been reset and actually the machine module doesn't even exist yet. So the board's been reset. So I do have to run that import machine command again. Uh, but you know, I don't need to run this every time I use it. Just only every time like my, my script runs. You know, usually you're probably gonna be writing code that's in a script file. And with Python, the convention is you put all of your imports at the top of the script. Just stick with that convention. That's usually what you wanna do. Put your imports there uh, and then you can use everything inside of there. Uh, okay, so now we create a digital input and it's really simple. We're gonna use that machine.pin class, but it's gonna be slightly different in how we define it. So we'll create a button object again. And this is an instance of the machine.pin class. We give the pin number, in this case it's 12 that I have connected the button. And then the type of input, and this is a little bit different. So it's a machine.pin.in, or the type of pin rather, not the type of input. So this is an input now, this is not an output, uh, which this I still makes sense. This, you know, this normally you'd say output if you wanna do an output here, but now we say input. And then the third parameter, this is optional. I don't have to use this. I could actually do this. This is a perfectly valid digital input right here. Um, but I want to enable that internal pull-up resistor that I was talking about. And so that's what you can do with that third parameter. So if I go back to this, if I specify this third parameter, if I give a value of machine.pin.pull underscore up, then this says turn on an internal pull-up for this uh, digital input. And so in that case now, it has this little internal pull-up. And so I'm gonna read the button value next. And I, I show in the tutorial here, you call the value function and you just, you don't send any parameters. And this will return back if it's a high or low logic level. So we say button.value and we get back one, which is a high logic level. Uh, so that's cool. 
And then let's see, if I press the button and I'm gonna keep it held down and I'll run the value function again, now I get zero. And if I release the button and run it again, I get zero, or I get one again. So, you know, it's pressed and I get zero, it's released and I get one. And that's exactly what we expect because remember when the button is not pressed, that input is floating or you know nothing is pulling it, but we have that internal pull-up resistor which actually pulls it up to a high logic level. And the, the button.value function returns one or a true value if it's at a high logic level. So we're seeing basically that you know that pull-up resistor pulled it up to 3.3 volts. We get that back as a true value from the value function. And then when I press the button, it connects the input to ground. So now the input is at, is at zero volts, it's at ground, and we get back a value of zero or false, which just means it's at a low logic level in this case. Uh, so pretty straightforward and, and, and uh, you know, hopefully easy to kind of grasp that you just call the value function and it will return back, you know, what is the current state of um, this input. And just for fun, I didn't do this in the guide, but, you know, let's create this without the pull-up resistor and see what happens here. So, you know, I just reran this. Uh, this is the cool thing about MicroPython. Like, it's all garbage collected. You know, I can just create a new instance of an object and it just goes and does it behind the scenes. And that old button instance up, up here, you know, it's going to free up the memory later and I don't need to worry about it. Uh, but okay, let's call button.value. I don't know, let's see what we get. So, okay, we happen to get a one there. Uh, I don't know, uh, l l let's just keep calling it. Hey, okay, so I'm not touching it now. Notice I'm getting zero. And you know, maybe if I move my finger here, can I get it to get a one? Uh, I don't know, I can't, I can't do it. But you saw it had a one earlier, now it had a zero. And it, I didn't change anything, I just pressed it a few times. So uh, so that that's the problem is that it's floating and you get these random values like that. So uh, just something to be aware of when you're using digital inputs, you know, be aware of like, what is the other thing connected to this digital input? Uh, some things are just always giving you a signal, like that PIR motion sensor I mentioned. You know, if you had one of these connected, it's always sending you a high or low logic signal. So you don't need to worry about turning on a pull-up resistor in that case. But for these buttons and the way we have it oriented, uh, you know, you do need to use some kind of pull-up resistor like that. Um, okay, and so then the next thing that I wanted to show in the guide was basically really common thing when you're dealing with buttons. How do you detect when the button is pressed? Uh, and so a simple thing could be like a loop that I show right here. So just a while true, like an infinite loop. Uh, and we can go into this loop and then we can put an if statement in here and we can say if not button dot value. So what this means, we're going to call the button dot value function and this is going to return back either a zero if the button is pressed or a one if it's not pressed. Uh, so think of it like when the button is pressed, it returns a false value. And when the button is released, it returns a true value. And then I only want to do things when the button is pressed. So I want to do things when the button dot value function is false. And the way that you do that is you say, I want to invert that with the Boolean not operator. So whenever button dot value returns false, it flips it around to be a true value. And then this if block is true, so it's going to run whatever code is inside of here. Like I can say button pressed, for example, um, inside of this loop. And then uh, you just have to make sure when you're done with the loop, you know, delete, delete to remove the indents. And so now it's running this loop. And let's see, I'm going to press the button just real briefly. And like, whoa, uh oh, I, you know, I, I just pressed it for half a second and it just filled the whole screen with button pressed messages. Uh, and so, you know, maybe you want that uh, because in some cases, like if I just wanted to light up the LED, um, that would be fine. Like instead of putting button, you know, printing button released or button pressed, I could just be, you know, running an LED uh, dot value true call that just lights up the LED. So just constantly lighting up the LED. And then maybe as soon as it's not uh, being pressed, then it's calling, you know, LED dot value false to turn off the LED. Like that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, but you might kind of wonder like, okay, how do I actually just detect only once when I press this button and when I release this button? It's because, you know, maybe you want to like fire a sound effect or, you know, turn on a relay or do something and you don't want to be constantly turning it on uh, like you saw here. So it's actually, it's, it's not super complex. I'll, I'll run through a little more complex code, but um, you know, we can explain it and, and show how this works. So the one thing though, uh, because I was running an infinite loop with that while true, press control C and that will interrupt the loop and get you back to the REPL. Um, okay, so now in this case, we're gonna make it a little more complex. And so uh, I'll just kind of, we'll type in this code as we go here. I need to import another module, the time module. 
Um, and then I want to, I've already got my button instance created right here. So I, I need to create a loop again now. So we'll say while true. And the way that this works, so, you know, I only want to do something once when it's pressed and once when it's released. So I want to detect when I press the button and when I release the button. And the one way you can do that, there are a lot of ways you can do this, but one way that I've used a lot is if you take two readings of the digital input. Uh, so you take a first reading and a second reading, and you're kind of looking for, you know, when is the point that the button input changes from a high to low level or from a low to high level. You know, you're looking for that point where it changes, not when it's at a low level or at a high level, but when it changes, it goes from low to high. And to detect that change, you kind of have to have at least two values because you need to look at, okay, here are two points in time and at this old point it was low and at this uh, you know, uh, more recent point it was high. So it must have changed in between those points in time. Uh, so that's exactly what I'm gonna do here. So I'll take a first reading uh, so I'm just going to call button.value and save this in a variable called first. Then I'm going to make a small delay. So this is just a 10 millisecond delay by calling time.sleep. And I'll talk a little bit more about this in a second. Uh, but I'm going to delay for a short period. And then I'm going to call the button.value function again and save this in a second variable uh, or a variable called second. <clears throat> so now I have my two readings here. So first has my initial reading and second has my uh, more recent or my second reading here. And with those two values, I can just look at what is the value of them. Like, you know, was my first reading uh, at a high logic level and then was my second reading at a low logic level, which means that the button must have been pressed because when it's not being pressed, it's at a high logic level. And then when it's being pressed, it goes down to a low logic level. So when the first reading is high and the second reading is low, someone just pressed the button effectively. So uh, I, I can put that in an if statement. So if my first reading is true uh, and not second, so that basically means if my first reading is true and my second reading is false because the not inverts the second reading, then print out uh, button pressed, for example. And then I can actually go a little bit further. I can also check for when the button is released because it's the exact opposite. So if not first and second. So that means if it was at a low logic level, if it was pressed and then it was released and went up to a, a high logic level or was true, then that's what the second little if case is gonna catch. And so I can say button released down here. Uh, and then let's close this out and let it run. And so now let's see what happens when I press it. So I get button pressed and I'm still holding it down. I release it, button released. So cool, you know, notice I can just press and release and I just get one little message. You know, even if I hold this thing down forever, I'm just getting this one pressed and then one released. Uh, so again, really, really useful because in a lot of cases you have a button like this, you really just want to know like when it's pressed, when it's released. Uh, you maybe not necessarily want to know all of the time that it's pressed or released uh, for this. Now the delay, I'll come back to this, um, the delay that we added here. So this is used for a few things. Um, you know, in one way, like I want a little bit of time to elapse because, you know, I'm waiting for the moment when someone presses their finger down and I want to make sure that I get a first reading before that and a second reading after that. And so this 10 millisecond delay is like, you know, where most of the time is going to be spent inside of this loop. You know, imagine the code just spinning through this wild true loop forever. And so it's just running, you know, it's getting an initial reading. It's going to delay for 10 milliseconds. It gets a second reading. It goes through this little if check real quickly. All of the code in here is super fast. Like even though it's MicroPython and it's interpreted, it's happening way faster than I can even comprehend, except for this time.sleep because I'm telling the, uh, the, the board, stop for 10 milliseconds and 10 milliseconds for a microcontroller is almost an eternity. You know, like uh, it, that's, that's multiple lifetimes uh, for a microcontroller. Whereas for us, for a human, like that's, you know, 10 times a second, that's pretty darn fast. Uh, so, you know, this is, this is slow for humans, but fast for microcontrollers. So, you know, in most cases, the, the, if, you know, at any moment in time that I'm looking at this board, it's probably inside of this time.sleep function. So, you know, when I move my finger over and press this button and release it, it's probably in this time.sleep. And so, you know, I'm going to catch that change uh, when I look at the, uh, the two values there. Now, the other reason I have a little delay is for debouncing because buttons are physical things. You know, there's a spring, there are metal contacts inside of the button. When I press the button down, 
there's a small point in time where those two pieces of metal are just barely starting to touch and you'll just randomly get, you know, maybe some electrons are able to move across or maybe the, the metal is physically moving a little bit and bending out of the way and bouncing around. So you can sometimes get this small little period and it only happens for a few milliseconds, which to a human we might not notice, but again, to a computer, it will instantly pick up, you know, okay, something happened in, this, in these few milliseconds. Uh, so, you know, for that small period of time, you're going to get some weird unstable readings and some buttons are maybe more better built and constructed and less susceptible to it. But in general, with buttons like this, you run into these debouncing issues. Uh, so the, the general strategy to get around that or one of the ways to get around that is to uh, when you detect a change, wait a small period of time and look again if the button has still changed, if it's still at the, the changed level. And that's kind of what this sleep does. You know, I take one reading, I sleep for a little while, so the button could be, you know, bouncing around randomly while I'm sleeping here, and then I take a second reading. So my assumption is during this delay, it's giving time for the button to settle a little bit. And sure, there could be some weird corner case where I just happen to press the button, you know, right as it's about to take this second reading and I get this weird, you know, debounce thing, but that's going to be so uncommon that I don't really care about it. Uh, so, you know, if, if you really care, then maybe you need to think of like more complex code for this, but keep it simple. You don't need to get that complex for this. So that's why I have this delay. And you might wonder like, well, how long should I delay? Um, you know, you want to keep this kind of short. Uh, you don't want to sleep for a long time because, you know, you, you don't want to miss like I could press and release that button. Uh, like if I was delaying for like, let's say two seconds, you know, if I press the button and released it within those two seconds, I will totally miss that event. Uh, so, you know, it's got to be kind of short, but you don't want it to be like nanoseconds long. Like you need some time to do the debouncing. So 10 milliseconds, that's usually short enough. You could probably go shorter. You could go a little longer too if you needed. Uh, there's no perfect value, but start with 10 milliseconds and, and go from there. And also realize like if you're doing other things inside of a loop, like, you know, just checking a button is maybe not the most interesting sketch, but you know, maybe you're going talking to some web service or whatever. That could be stuff that takes time. And so maybe you want to do the things that take time in between reading your buttons and things like that. So, you know, you might need to structure your code in different ways for that. So, okay, so that's it. That's all I wanted to show in this video. Um, you know, really just showing how to use a digital input here and specifically how to use a button. Uh, but again, like there are other things you could connect and read as digital inputs. So I mentioned uh, like a switch. So I didn't show, uh, but there are slide switches that you can use. So uh, I think we have some links in the, uh, well, here, let's just go to the, the switch page here. But a slide switch is, you know, you can move this switch into an on or off position. So it's, you don't have to hold it down all the time. And so it has three pins. And basically it's like when the button is in this right position here, then this right pin is connected to the middle pin versus the left, when it's in the left position, then the left pin is connected to the middle pin. So you'd hook up this middle pin to a digital input. And then maybe the left pin, you could hook up to a high logic level, like your 3.3 volts. And then the other one you could hook up to ground. So then you know, if you read like a high level, the switch must be in the left position here because it's connected to that. And similarly for ground. So you could do slide switches. Uh, there are all kinds of types of buttons and, and fun switches you could use. Uh, but also stuff, like I mentioned, you know, the motion sensor, PIR motion sensor. This is a little sensor that gives you a digital output. So this, uh, I believe it's the yellow wire, will be at a high logic level when it detects motion and a low logic level when it doesn't detect motion. Then it needs power and ground, obviously, here. Uh, but you could hook this up to a digital input and read it with MicroPython. So that's, you know, a powerful thing to think about. Uh, or like a magnetic door sensor uh, I mentioned here, too. So these are kind of cool. You know, you uh, screw these into a door and it's basically a little magnetic sensor and then a magnet next to it. And so you can detect when this magnet gets near that sensor, it can change the level uh, that, that you can read from this. So again, really cool, uh, fun stuff that you can do just with digital inputs here, uh, basic stuff. So, okay, so that's it with digital inputs. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, I didn't mention this in the guide, but there is actually more to digital inputs that I didn't get into here. And maybe in the future, I'll get into it just because it looks like it's a little bit in flux with MicroPython, uh, but there is a concept of an external interrupt. And so this is basically where you can, instead of, you know, notice in my uh, tutorial here, like I made this loop where I was just waiting to see, okay, is this button pressed and then do something. Um, but you can do something where you can tell the microcontroller, hey, look at this input. And if it changes, 
run some code and you know I'm not even going to run a loop. I don't need to do anything in my main code. Just the microcontroller itself will be set up to know that when this pin changes from like a high to low level or a low to high level, run some callback function that I defined right here. And so it's really cool. They have a syntax here. You create this IRQ object. Um, you know, and, and you can give it a callback function here and you can specify like trigger this when it's falling, which means it's going from a high to low level or when it's rising, like it's going from a low to high level, uh, which is kind of nice in that, you know, like you saw, we had this debouncing logic and, um, you know, I don't think they do debouncing in MicroPython, but it's kind of similar in that you're looking for that change from in low to high. Uh, now, the reason I didn't want to get into this is because it is a little complex. Um, whenever you deal with interrupts and interrupt handlers, uh, basically the microcontroller is interrupting itself. It's interrupting whatever main code is running to go run some other code. And there are lots of constraints that get put on that other code that you're running because it has to happen really quickly because remember your main code is stopped and your main code is like expecting to run pretty quickly. Like it might be talking to a sensor or doing something. And if it has to stop for a second to go run some other code, that could have some impact here. And so they kind of call out here, uh, that you know you need to be careful uh, as you know your callback functions are limited in what they can do they cannot allocate memory for example and I have a feeling that's because if it allocates memory that might trigger the garbage collector which takes a lot of time and you don't want to do that in an interrupt handler so you have to be careful and you kind of have to know a little bit about interrupts I think I'm probably going to come back to this later but I did want to mention it and that there is some capability here if you're a little more advanced uh, generally what you want to do in an interrupt uh, like they show like printing stuff out you probably don't even want to do that. You really just want to set like a variable. So have like a global variable that says like, hey, my button was pressed. And just in your interrupt handler set, you know, button pressed equals true. And then have your main loop running. So like, you know, here's our main loop here that's like checking for the button pressed. Now it doesn't need to check the button.value function. Just look at that global variable and see, is it true? Has the button been pressed? And you know it will only be set true when that interrupt handler is called. Uh, and setting a variable is usually a pretty fast operation for a chip. Like you don't need to worry about it and it really, it shouldn't allocate memory. I would hope in MicroPython that, you know, setting something true doesn't allocate memory. Uh, so just something to be aware of. That's usually the strategy you want rather than trying to put a bunch of code. Like you don't want to go call an internet service or something in, in an interrupt handler here, you know, flip a variable and then in your main loop, check to see, you know, at the top of that loop, has that thing been flipped? And okay, now I need to go and talk to this internet service or update some state or do something like that. So again, we'll come back and maybe play with this later uh, for that. So, um, okay, so that was all that I wanted to show. I guess I'll show one last thing that I kind of mentioned in the guide. I said, you know, hey, uh, what? go off on your own and see if you can change this code so that when you press the button, it turns on the LED. And when you release the button, it turns it off. Uh, so I guess I figured, you know, hey, maybe I'll implement it here in the video. If you want to do this yourself, maybe turn off the video, you know, we're done. There's nothing else left for this. Uh, but I'll just show you if you're kind of curious, you know, here's one way that you could do this. Um, so I'll press control C, I'll kill this code uh, that was running because remember I was in a loop there. And uh, okay, so I have my button object and I can call button.value. And remember, you know, we initialized this and this is the cool thing with MicroPython, just press up and it'll go through. These were all the previous commands that I ran. I think it only has the last 10 commands or so. But, you know, remember, so I had this, um, you know, button object that I created. So, uh, you know, I want to control the LED. So I also need to create an LED object. So let's create that LED object as an output. And this is pin 15 and it's a machine.pin.out object that I'm going to create. And so, you know, now I can say LED.high and turn it on and LED.low, turn it off. Uh, and now, you know, I think I can keep this simple. Like this is a case where I don't really need to do all that debouncing logic and take two readings and all that. Let's just make a simple while true loop in here. Uh, and then let's just see if button dot value. So, you know, this basically means if the button value is true, which means it's not being pressed, then let's say LED dot low and then else. So now if the button is false, which means it's being pressed, it's connected to ground, LED.high. So let's do that. And this should be good enough. So now when I press this, hey, check that out, the LED turns on and I release it, turns off, on, off. 
So that's cool. And you know, when I'm pressing this, like it's constantly evaluating and constantly calling this LED.high function. And that's okay because you know, I, it's not changing the LED really. Like it's, it's just, it was on before and it's on again here. Uh, oh, you might've noticed this. This is debug output from the uh, ESP8266 because I've, I'm running a custom firmware right now. So I've gone into this before. If you see weird stuff like this, use the official MicroPython releases. I think this is one of the analog inputs. Sometimes it does weird debug output like this. So, you know, just be aware if you see weird stuff like that. Uh, but, you know, again, this, that's one way to do this code here is just keep it simple. You know, I don't have to do that logic, but there's nothing saying that I couldn't do this. You know, if I wanted so that maybe every time I press the button, it toggles it on or off or something like that. You know, I can adapt this code to do that. You know, just create that LED object and then maybe change its state inside of here. So, okay, I'll wrap this up then. Uh, if folks have questions, maybe throw them into the chat and we'll see if we can get to them. Um, okay, let's see. Let's go to the main headshot view also real quick. We'll go here. So let's see. Uh, someone was wondering, are people writing libraries for well-known sensors yet? Um, yeah, so check out uh, the MicroPython forums. I know on the ESP8266, uh, some folks, uh, like some of the regular contributors to MicroPython have actually gone through and implemented for most of the feather wings that we have. They have some basic code and I'm hopefully gonna get to that in the next few weeks. Uh, you know, once we look at how to use some of the basic hardware stuff, uh, we'll start implementing and, and having some libraries ourselves uh, to access some of the Adafruit hardware. But check the MicroPython forums uh, because that's kind of where the center of the MicroPython community is. And uh, they've got lots of cool stuff. Like there's OLEDs, uh, drivers. Um, I'm pretty sure there's stuff like some of the servo drivers maybe potentially. Like there's, there's code out there to start taking a look at. Uh, and check out the last video I did on importing modules because once you have code, you, you might wonder, well, how do I use this in a script? And so the last video I did on importing modules, that shows how to put a code file on your board and import it and use it with your other code files. So you're gonna need that if you're using libraries like that. Um, so, okay, uh, let's see. Well, uh, question here. Da, 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 da. Uh, I don't think there are any questions. Oh, let's see. Uh, oh yeah, someone was saying change the value of pin seems uh, to do an interu interrupt. Oh, okay, so someone's saying basically it, you can change a pin if you have one of these interrupt handlers hooked up and you wanna like turn an LED on or off. It looks like you can do that. So yeah, that, you could, you know, try it and see what happens. Like the worst that happens is like you spend too much time in an inter interrupt handler and um, you know, maybe it, it interrupts or messes up the code that you were running. Um, although you do have to be a little careful because MicroPython's a little more complex. You know, it's got this garbage collector and like anytime you're allocating memory, which you might not even really know when you're allocating memory. Like, you know, when I create an instance, for example, of, um, you know, the, a button object, like button equals machine dot pin, that's allocating some memory behind the scenes, even though, I'm not seeing like a new or a malloc call like you would see in the C programming language or Arduino that kind of gives you a hint that you're allocating memory. All of that's hidden in Python. So, uh, and you do have to be careful because when you're allocating memory, uh, MicroPython is a garbage collected language. It might need to go through and see like, okay, I don't have enough free memory. I better go check and see, are there variables that aren't being used right now? And I can go and garbage collect and free up. And so there's a whole process for that that can take some time. And you know, there's little things that happen behind the scenes sometimes to be careful about for that. So uh, otherwise, okay, I'll, I'll wrap this up then. I think that was uh, the end of the video, no more questions. So thanks a lot for watching. Uh, this is Tony D and this was a look at digital IO with MicroPython. So the start of what will be a, a series of MicroPython hardware videos. So the next video, and I like to do at least a couple of videos every week, Next video I'm thinking I'll do on analog IO and a few different things. So some MicroPython boards have uh, digital to analog converters and analog to digital converters. So that, that those let you basically read analog signals and create analog signals. And then there's also a concept of a PWM or a pulse width modulation output, which isn't technically analog, but you can do analog like things with it. And I'll, I'll show more about that in a future video. Uh, so that's what I'm thinking for the next video. And then we'll get more into like how to talk to I squared C and spy devices and maybe other hardware things with MicroPython. Uh, and if you do wanna go further, like I said, check out the documentation for your board. Um, all the documentation for MicroPython gets just started with the basics of, you know, here's all of the different hardware peripherals and things. So, you know, check those out if you wanna go further yourself. 
Uh, but yeah, check out youtube.com slash Adafruit. That's where I put this video and all kinds of other fun project videos up there. Uh, check out twitch.tv slash Adafruit. That's where I like to stream things live. Like I said, I like to stream a couple times a week on Fridays and on Mondays. Uh, although this Monday is a holiday. Uh, I think it's Labor Day, I want to say, or Memorial Day. I always get those confused. Uh, but it's it's the end of summer holiday, effectively. So there won't be a stream Monday, but Tuesday, I think I'll catch up and we'll do the analog I.O. stream then. So uh, take a look then on Monday for, or on Tuesday for that. So uh, until then, this is Tony, uh, Tony D. And uh, if you like this video, check out uh, all the other MicroPython videos that we've done and then click the like and the comment and subscribe. You know, let us know that this is good stuff and that you like this and we'll keep doing these videos and things like that. So uh, until then, I'll see you guys later. Thanks a lot for watching.